Now, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Black Tech Fest panel on the changing landscape of the music industry in a digital world. So in this panel, we're going to hear from musical industry experts on their observations on what's changing for artists and their teams when it comes to building a fan base and breaking through. I'll allow our very special panelists to tell us a bit about who they are, what they do, and give us a bit brief overview of their experience before uh, we jump into the conversation. If you could start with Nikita first, then on to Pace. Amazing. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Nikita Chowen here. I'm the founder of Translate NC. It's a talent management hub. We look after DJs, artists, producers from across the globe. Our roster consists of Show Them Camp, DJ Semtex, Guilty Beats, Twitch Forever, and Day on the Track. And then we also have the consultancy PR and strategic marketing arm. And we work on campaigns and releases from the NFL to NBA to um, artists from the US to Africa. Um, and beyond, even from Haiti, and uh, we kind of like strategize and look at ways we can kind of add value and build brands and profiles and music projects within the UK and European space and also outside of that. Great, thank you. And on to Jason. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for having me this uh, today. Uh, my name is Jason Capana. Um, I'm the Senior Vice President of Artists and Label Relations uh, here at Title, um, but my career started off really in the traditional label space. I worked at Universal Records for 12 years, where I served as the VP of Operations and Director of A&R at a label called SRC, which was recently honored at the BET Awards so that with Loud 30. It was so dope to see some of the artists that I worked with performing, um, giving credit to Steve Rifkin and, and the whole team that that put some amazing music together over the years. So my journey into tech really started off with making music traditionally, um, you know, CDs and vinyl um, back in those days. And of course, um, as uh, I saw streaming start to come in to our space and I saw our brick and mortar stores starting to close down like Circuit City and things like that, it really kind of gave me the urge to want to explore streaming more. And um, I, I got into that world um, probably around 2013, 14 at a company called uh, All Deaf Digital, um, where I ran streaming for ADD52, a company that was owned by Steve Rifkin and, and, and Russell Simmons. And um, from there, I was tapped to come to help and start Title back in 2015. And so I've been here since uh, 2015, so it's going on seven years plus. And um, it's an amazing thing because I, I look at uh, the differences for me between working on the, on the streaming side of things and working out of labels that I get to support the artist community without having, you know, them have to be signed to my label. I can support the art simply for the art. And um, that's what been, what's been the best part about working on this side of, of, of the music industry. Mm, great. And as you guys can see, we've got some very, very qualified people to share their insights with us today. And just kind of uh, following something that uh, Jason mentioned, uh, talking about fine vinyls, CDs, kind of brick and mortar stores kind of fading out. It's very obvious that the world's a very different place to 20 years ago, even five years ago. And we've got information at our fingertips, at a click of a button. And of course, this has kind of impacted how we consume music. Obviously, there's upsides. I think you could argue that less barriers to entry for a new artist. Like, I can upload a snippet on TikTok, which blows. Um, and like, songs can just like one day get like 500k views and this is really exciting for artists but at the same time I think there might be something to say about how this affects our attention spans as consumers um, are we always looking for the next new thing rather than actually taking the time to digest art that's been given to us um, so as people who are quite closely linked to artists and both upcoming and perhaps more established what are, what are the kind of um, things that are keeping you up at night uh, in this new landscape um, whoever wants to take it first. I think um, I'll jump in first, but I think um, it's really interesting. You hit like a few different points. Um, before I set up Translate NC, I used to work within BBC Radio One Extra, so radio. And obviously, even going from radio to how music is consumed now, I think there's a whole journey with music now. And I think there's different elements. And, you know, going to your question of what keeps me up at night, I think something that I talk to my clients a lot about um, is the fact that at the core of it is having a strong fan base because you can get like 
something could be very successful on TikTok and you can be very successful on the number side, but are those numbers translating into ticket sales? Are they translating into people buying your merch? So I always go back to the thing of like when when we go to when we go to market with anything, whether that be music, whether that be um, touring, etc., it's about connecting with that core fan base. And um, the things that keep me up at night is having that, is making sure that whatever we do, is building that base that sticks with you. An example and something that went viral earlier this year was um, Tyler the Creator talking about how he marketed his album. So it wasn't like one week and oh my god, he he's worked that album for a whole year to the point that every time you listen to it, you take something different away. And I think that's what's important. I think the things that keep me up at night are thinking about how to build a strong fan base, a fan base, a community, a movement, and that's they're the element. So, but whilst doing that, tapping into the new mediums like a TikTok, but making sure it's done in a way that feels right for each each person and each individual. So, I always say that there's no one size fits all. There are tick boxes that you can do, like okay, content. You know, the way you release music, it has to be on distro. Um, go via distro, then be on a DSP, etc. And then you want to get it on radio, and then you want to do press. But then you as an individual, you have to build your base. And that's a lot about your music, what you're saying and where you come from. So, for example, um, Twitch, he's just dropped a record and okay, content. But now I'm like, okay, now we've got to do something on ground where we're connecting with real people. As much as social is so important, it's also about going out and connecting with people and having that one-on-one -on -one time. Because those people that are there at the start of your journey most likely stay all the way throughout. So it's about having those real life moments. But also the flip side is, the having these platforms means that everything's so much more global. Like you can connect to DMs, you can go on and you can get into the DMs, you can hit, you know, one minute you're trending in um, South Africa and then it could be Brazil and that's exciting. So I think it's about looking at, making sure that you're studying the analytics. I'm a geek, I go, I go into the background, I'm looking at, oh, who's picking up what? Where can we be touring? What's going on here? How do we tap into this? So they're the things that are keeping me up at night. And I think there's two ways of looking at it. You can fear it or you adapt to it and you start making it work within and how you can utilize it and understanding for your artist, your client or wherever you're going, how you can br bring those things to life um, and how you can really, for example, with a title, right. you know, my, one of my clients got a piece has got a production page on there. And I was like, that's important because there's there's ways to connect those dots now we can go into the back end and understand hey we're actually connecting with these parts of the world so that's what's keeping me up at night how do we connect not just online but in real life yeah i think i think you said it perfectly right um i think one of the things that really stuck out to me there was like adapting right um and it, that's been kind of like one of the 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 main points of, of of my career it's really adapting to where this thing that i love is going and and that's music and and there were so many barriers to entry back in the days you cannot just make a record and put it out and have it be played on the radio you know uh, even from a label standpoint the artists on to my label like akon and and, and david banner and, and even to, uh, fat joe and terror squad you know in order to put out a record like lean back We'd had to have the record like three to six months in advance before you guys would even hear it. I think the big difference today is that an artist without a label, without any type of uh, even a distributor, can make a record in their room and have it up like immediately and have that in immediate feedback. And um, it just speeds things up to a point where sometimes you do get concerned whether people are able to digest this music in a way that that, you know, makes sense you know for me when i meet with artists and I, I you know i continue to do so to this day even during you know during this unfortunate pandemic over the last few years it went from artists coming to our office to us me myself going directly to them it, it it all begins and ends with the music you know what i mean whether that song is five minutes or two minutes it's gotta be a good record at the end of the day and even though you know people might latch on to things that are catchy at the end of the day, you're going to have to make some good music to, to continue in, in that same space, to continue to build that fan base that wants to hear more and more from you. And um, what I love about what we've been doing at Title is like, 
we've been adapted. And so, you know, Nikita mentioned, you know, Guilty Beats credits. Credits is something that's been a part of what we've done since 2015. So no longer can you open up a CD and read the liner notes, but we're going to provide that for you. And how we've expanded on it is that we've taken that metadata that we received from the labels and it's all there on the platform. So now when you see one record that you might have heard from Guilty Beats, you could tap his name and see his entire discography. And it really, really just kind of like takes a discovery um, of, of an artist to just another level. And not just an artist, the discovery of a producer, an engineer, a vocalist, a songwriter. You know, now you can sit on the title platform and just dive deep into someone that you might have not have known of before, but now all of a sudden you got their entitled, uh, entire catalog in front of you. And we're doing really unique things as well. Like, you know, last year we launched a, a program um, called Direct Artist Payouts, you know, which is a first of its kind, right? You know, we, we encourage um, the fans to stream their favorite artists and those artists can make a fraction of, of, uh, of the revenue from their monthly um, subscription fee. You know what I mean? And, and, and it really took the, the element of like, you know, fans figuring out different ways to make money from streaming to like, if you're a fan of, for example, if I was lucky enough to be a, a talented artist, um, if you're a fan of me, I don't necessarily have to be as big as the biggest artist on the charts to be able to get a little something extra from, from my fan base. And so I think we're, we're continuously working on things to really kind of like carve out our own lane and be different and not being afraid of change. Oh, thank you very much. Some really, really interesting insights there from the importance of building a dedicated fan base to kind of how I think it's really interesting, Jason, talking about uh, adaption because it's either, I think Nikita mentioned, you can be scared of it or you can embrace the changes and kind of mold that to your unique path. And kind of linking to that, um, I think the, the point about fans really, uh, really stuck to me. Uh, it kind of reminded me about um, Nipsey Hussle, the late Nipsey Hussle. I think there's a lot talking about um, his idea of like the I think it's a hundred times to really buy into you and your music um you're able to make that uh, make that profit and then linking to the adaption point um he was actually uh, taking that on an emerging technology with his store um out there as well so um in line in line with that what type of things have you seen that have been quite exciting um with quite exciting ways of people engaging their fan base uh in the past few years well, I mean, just to kind of, you know, since you brought up Nip and, and the rest in peace, you know, I, I, I want to speak a little bit on on what his relationship was like with Title and my interactions with him and his team personally that still continue to this day, um, which still amazes me, you know. Um, I met Nip maybe uh, a few a few months before he dropped uh, the Victory Lap album. He came to the Title office and played the album for me and, and the team. And what I got to say about that man is that, you know, we, we just believed immediately, you know, and, and he knew exactly how he wanted to market that project. He knew exactly how he wanted to roll it out. And we just wanted to be a part of the journey. So we invested in the live stream of his album release concert before there were any numbers, before we knew if it was going to be a successful album or not. We jumped on it and live streamed his debut album release concert. And not only that, you know, we've done continuous interviews and playlists and, and, and his, his love for not only his fans, but also technology and the future of technology. Um, it's been something that's really paid off in, in multiple folds to the point that when, unfortunately, when he lost his life, you know, you know, we, we came back and we actually, um, broadcasted the the celebration of his life and to, and it's to this day you know it's one of the most requested things when people come to us they want to they want to see his interviews they want to collect those sound bites and the way that he spoke about you know connecting his fan base in a way that he was just open to just trying different things with his fans I think artists today like La Russell has learned from that because he himself is just you know um, implemented a, a similar structure where fans could choose how much they want to pay for his music and for merch and things like that. I think um, that stuff definitely spills over to our size as we try to figure out 
how to come up with unique ways for uh, the fans on title connect to connect with their favorite artists and vice versa. Yeah, I think like, you know, you've touched on Russ. I think one thing about Russ I can say is like, he's so consistent. Like he's so like drop, drop, drop. And that's the thing. One thing that stuck out for me in the last couple of years has been like, okay, you know what? Even just a couple of weeks ago, Kid Cudi with the album drop and then the Netflix um, animated uh, movie drop. And I don't know, that's um, the reason that was exciting is because sometimes you don't get to consume music the way you want to, especially I know, like, I'm like, oh, the list of to listen to that I want to really consume, because for me, I like to listen to the lyrics, like the first listen, it says like, there's a line that you might have missed, and then you go back and you're like, oh my gosh, that went into this, and you know, I, I still enjoy that, but I know that doesn't, we don't have the time or the attention span with the way we're hit with so many things, especially with the timelines, but then the fact that when it was on Netflix, and I was watching, watching the Intergalactic, and I was like, Yo, I want to go listen to the music. So I think that to me is like finding those different touch points. And I'm going to give an example of like what we're doing with Show Them Clap. So last week we dropped Poem My Music 3. You know, if you haven't got it, go stream it on Tidal. <laughs> hey. <laughs> right. But yeah, so with, you know, that dropped last week and all this week it's been going on the timelines and people are talking about the project. And then, you know, um, we're having conversational pieces around it. But then we had the launch party in London. Tomorrow, well, last week, sorry, on Friday, we had the pop-up. And then on Sunday, the festival. So you can kind of take different experiences. And I think that's what's exciting. It's about how you elongate the touch points for projects. You know, um, if, you, if you think about it, it's like that thing of like, you know, I like what Joey Badass did with like, you know, the, la the latest drop. Kind of, you know, going back, being nostalgic with it, but coming with a fresh spin. Because that's the thing, it's going back to the fans and like, but then doing the live show and tapping in with the fans and then he's coming to the UK and, you know, even like we kind of do like a 10 year celebration of the fact of that last mixtape. They're the things that excite me. I think the reason they're exciting is because there's multiple touch points for it. And I think it's going back to the earlier point of in real life, online, and sometimes it might be a bit of nostalgia, but it's also about you're following that artist's career and then you're going back. And then you're like, oh, if I didn't know, I could tap in at this point and go back to that journey. And I think that's what's exciting about the way the music is right now. It's like, actually, we, we can play with a lot more. We have a lot more mediums and we can be as creative as we want, especially with everything we have at our fingertips. We, we actually did that just recently, right? Um, you know, you know, title, we've been lucky enough to be able to put, especially emerging artists, our title rising program is one of our biggest focus. We like to, you know, support our artists from the ground up, you know, so there's a plenty of artists that, you know, will support from day one and follow them throughout their journey. But most recently, we were able to partner with um, fashion designer Kim Shuey for her New York Fashion Week show. And she tasked us with, uh, coming, uh, curating the music bed for her runway show, which was like, in my opinion, like a Herculean task. But we were able to find an emerging producer by the name of Stelios and partner him with Kim and come up with the music for her runway show using crowdsourced voicemails from her fans that he incorporated into the beat. And also he brought in um, a, a young artist by the name of Dizzy Faye, who's just phenomenal and an instrumentalist uh, by the name of Pip uh, to come up with this like 15 minute sound bed that was blasting throughout Grand Central Terminal um, for New York Fashion Week. That's something that we would have never even thought of doing in the past, but putting artists in a position for their music to be discovered in unique ways is something that we've leaned into. And um, I love that about what, what what we have coming up in the future. It's like that not being afraid to just do something different and, you know, put um, artists in uh, amazing situations that they might not have typically be able to get on their own. No, 100%. And I really, really enjoy listening to both of those both of those insights. And I think kind of a, a theme that I could draw from both is the idea of like building experiences um, when I think about like myself, like the music that really sticks with me is like music that can attach to a certain time, a certain experience. Maybe I saw it live. And in, uh, in the case of the New York Fashion Week, I don't think anyone's going to forget or they hear a song is like, oh, I remember that's the one that I heard when I went to New York Fashion Week back in 2022. So I think that's, uh, that's really exciting. I think it's really important 
for us to understand that music is one thing, but it's also like the way it makes you feel and the kind of the kind of like long lasting impact it has. And um, we're just rounding up now. I just want to get some thoughts um, about just just about um, as a musician, you kind of mentioned that you can focus on producing the music, but also how do you connect with your fans um, and things like that. What what other ways do you suggest artists should divide their time when it comes to like for example a rollout and just in general building that fan base is it just focus purely on the music don't worry about like the social media stuff someone else will handle it or is it a bit of a 50 50 because i think that might be quite a hard balance i think i have some think the time should be uh, dedicated or do you think it's a more of a case-by-case basis the most important thing i'll say know your strengths and if you as an artist don't know your strengths, your team needs to know your strengths because there's artists I know who can go into the studio and they can write melodies like this or they'll produce a beat like this. But they're not the ones who are going to be on TikTok doing dances. So it's like, it's about, it's going back to that thing. Know your skills and your strengths and that's where you can start dividing your time. So it's like, if you know, you, okay, if you know I am the greatest lyricist I, I can go in and I can put pen to paper and all I'm going to do is spit fire. Sick. You focus on that, but then delegate or have someone within your team who can kind of pick that. Okay, you're not going to focus on that, but we can build this out by doing this. So maybe what it is, you know, who are they have, who's doing this amazingly well is Coast Contra. The, the, what they've done with the freestyles, right? They've connected. That's like, that's their skill. That's their strength. And you've connected with it, but it kind of seems effortless with the rollout. I feel like they like it looks like they divide social media time with studio time and performance time equally, but we don't know the ins and outs of that. But it's a way to understand your skill strength, your skill set. So, um, all of it's important. Rollout is a, music is an oil. Music is the most important thing. If the product's not there, we have nothing. But I think obviously music first and foremost, and that's that's the main focus of any artist producer. But then the, all those things around it goes to strength. So are you a vocal person? Do you like being, being out and about and talking? And if that's the case, then yeah, okay, your social media strategy, you're going to be quite hands-on with. But maybe you're not creative with social media. Maybe you don't like being front-facing. So have someone who can create that. So you can have like an art director or a content director, etc. So I think it's about knowing, knowing your, skills, your skill set and your strengths and then working around it. But... The most important thing is the music. Once the music is at the best place it can be, then you can only build up from there. And it's about finding the right people to build with and identifying with the things you enjoy as a creative. And then I say from like a managerial point of view, that's what I look at with my clients. I'm like, what are the skill sets? You're really great at this, but maybe what maybe you don't really tend to lean into this as much. But that's okay because there's ways to work around it. Now there's so many roles. There's, it's like the reason I think the space right now is exciting as much as it's like oh it's kind of like all for ta- all for the taking which is exciting is there are no limits there is no one set way of doing things so I think that's the exciting thing about it so you just have to figure out what you're comfortable with what you're passionate about but the music the more I would say music's the oil music's the most go-to thing like you said you could be in a show and you remember that moment for life it's the music that did that all the other things around it you just have to know what you can delve into and what you kind of have to be like, I'm going to take a step back. You might be the best creative, but you might not have the business mindset. Cool, that's okay. Just let somebody else handle that. So I think it's all like each to their own and being very transparent and honest in those conversations as a team. Now that's great. Thank you. And Jason, any like last thoughts on that as well? Yeah, it's, it's, um, um, I'm here marveling. I'm so glad I'm doing this panel with you, Nikita, because I, I thought of Coast Contra like immediately. You know what I mean? Like I, I posted that first video just like everybody else did. Like, are y'all seeing this? You know what I mean? And 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 they're not doing anything other than what they do, which is just spit. You know what I mean? Which is just being lyrical. And and we are, are we as like the, the 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 fans that are discovering them get a chance to just sit back and be like wow this is this is incredible um i tell every artist man like sometimes you can only be as good as the team you surround yourself with you know what i mean it's it's important i think to have the right people beside you you have a lot of incredibly talented artists that don't make it as far as other others simply because they don't necessarily haven't necessarily assembled the right team and i think at title we try to fill in those gaps right 
you might not have a label we tr- you know that can invest in in certain things for you we try to fill in that gap you may have a, a manager who just started out we might have a little bit more skill set in 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 some of the things or opportunities that a manager may provide for an artist we try to fill in those gaps we want to try to build kind of like a, a 360 ecosystem where we're supporting the, them from the business side of things, marketing, from fan engagement, commerce. That is the hope for the future of, of titles. Continue to um, put especially rising artists um, in a position where they can take advantage of all of these elements where, that they may be very new to, right? They might just want to just make music and that's fine too. But having the, the, the right team um, behind you or that right person behind you that can help just steer you in, in the right direction and also steer you away from certain things as well, I think is a, an, an important asset in any artist's career. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot and I hope all of our listeners have as well. I think we've touched on some very important topics, such as building a dedicated fan base. Um, we learned a lot about like what title does in terms of artist discovery um and also i think what's really interesting and a great conclusion is that music is the most important thing at the end of the day but also you have to know yourself as an artist and know what your strengths are and what your limits are and i think we can conclude that despite the fact that the the landscape has changed the thing that always remains is making good music will get you far so thank you very much for listening and hope you have a great day now, I want to thank you guys as well. Thank you so much for having me. I think platforms like this are equally as important because information um, that are provided to these artists that are out there looking for it, um, that's that's just as important as anything else, you know? So thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So Colour and Tech is a not-for-profit here based in London in the UK, which is focused on really creating opportunities for that next generation of technology evangelists, innovators, investors, entrepreneurs and workers ultimately. assessment center um, I had practice sessions with the other um, colleagues that really helped me quite a lot because when I actually did the assessment center it felt really easy because I knew what was what I was doing so it's been a great support yeah I think they're the reason why I'm here Signing up for RISE made me want to accelerate that validation process. Having someone with an outside perspective who knows what they're doing, they're in the industry, they're in the ecosystem, just saying, actually, you're good at this, your idea is great, and we want to support you has been immensely helpful. Um, And I think the confidence I've gained over the last three months has been, I think I'm a shadow of myself from before. The order. You've now crossed over into the pizza zone. A window of pizzeria anticipation. Your mind has melted into mozzarella. Pizza, 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 pizza. <laughs> Go on, do a little pizza dance. Dance round and round like a pizza. Oh, that was quick. Mm, nice jacket. Oh, bingo. Deliveroo. Food. We get it.